Hello folks, here we are at Lawa Air Base on the Persian Gulf map. I'm sitting here in an A4E and I'm going to take a look at a couple of things in the cockpit. One during the startup procedure and the other one we'll just talk about afterwards. And then I'm going to fly the pattern twice. Once um, with the uh, manual version of flying the optimum angle of attack of 17 and a half units and the second using the APC to do the same thing to show you the difference and maybe discuss a little bit of the uh, of the logic behind using either one. Okay without any further ado I've already got the uh, start cart um, and power cart uh, which is an all-in-one thingamajig uh, to my right there and you can see I've got power on, I've got the ladder lights and I've got the light on the manual fuel control and the test lights work. Okay and uh, the first thing I want to talk about is the EGT or the exhaust gas temperature meaning the sensor for the temperature is um, behind the engine in the in the exhaust duct so it's uh, aft of the turbine blades and so it picks up the heat from combustion and in order to just kind of a review here in order to start a jet engine you need three things you need air you need spark and you need fuel without all three you don't have combustion without combustion you don't have anything but the, the day's temperature reading on the EGT indicator or re maybe residual heat from an earlier flight but it's going to be low. Okay so uh, I gave you the three items in order air, spark, and fuel and we could talk about the reasons for that but that's just the best way it works. Okay so we'll come over here and look at the start button and what does that do? That opens the start valve. Now this hose here is providing air um, to the underside of the airplane here you can see and it goes uh, through tubing up to a valve I don't know the exact route or where it actually is located but it it uh, it ultimately uh, arrives at a valve that this button will open allowing air into the engine which will turn the engine up to about 20 uh, RPMs. That's about as much as that air source can provide us. So sometime between 0 and 20 we've got to start combustion so the engine will uh, wind up to its idle RPM of about 55. Um, during that process the EG2 reacts to the combustion and so once, uh, once combustion um, has occurred the EGT will sense the increasing temperature in the exhaust duct and will rise at a fairly good clip uh, steady all the way up to about 400 yeah, maybe 420 maybe 430 440 and then um, as the engine catches on and it's the RPM reaches about 45 or 50 the compressor blades are drawing enough cooling air into the intake that it actually cools down the exhaust gas temperature and uh, so it reduces back to the steady state value of about 340 uh, at idle and that's the way it should work but the way it, it works now in the simulation is that as soon as I introduce um, spark which is step two uh, we haven't had combustion we don't have combustion yet the EGT needle will react to that uh, introduction by moving steadily and directly to about 340. It goes, I think it goes to 320 initially and then creeps up to 340. Um, so we'll take a look at that. So without any further ado and before we do that we always want to turn the anti-collision light on uh, and I'll turn on the exterior lights and the uh, cabin pressure. And I'll make sure my throttle switch is in the forward position. And I, I turn on the cabin pressure switch because you want the uh, the cockpit to pressurize while we're uh, on the ground so when we taxi the canny the canopy doesn't rattle in its cradle by doing uh, by throwing that switch to norm it uh, once the canopy is closed it'll fill up the uh, the 
the uh, the canopy seal, which is between the canopy itself. Uh, it's this right along here. It inflates and sort of holds the canopy steady and holds pressure inside the canopy. Okay, um, so let's go ahead and demo this. We were, should be ready to start here. So we'll hit the start button and that allows air into the engine and you can see it's starting to wind up. And at 5%, I come down here and I right click on the throttle, bringing the throttle inboard, which starts the igniters. And look, notice the EGT is already at 320, going to 340 degrees. And I'm just now getting to 20% without any fuel. So there's no combustion. So that's incorrect. So let's just go ahead and complete the cycle. We'll bring the throttle around the horn, which introduces fuel into the mixture. Now we have combustion, and we know that because the RPM is increasing above 20%. It's getting more and more. The compressor blades are drawing more and more cooling air in there. And so the temperature at this point would be coming up uh, about 400 degrees, 420, 430, and it's starting to slow down and it's starting to go back to about 340 degrees as the RPM reaches 55. Okay, then that's how it should run. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and turn on a few more switches here. We'll get the Doppler started to uh, we'll t check the test here on the navigation uh, thing here. And so that looks good. So I'm going to go back to standby now. Uh, we'll turn the radio on so we can talk to people. We'll turn the TAC in to uh, uh, receive to get it to warm up for about 90 seconds. We'll put in the, the uh, code for the local TAC in. And we'll, we'll, we'll uh, turn on the uh, uh, ICLS, even though we're not going to use it today. And since we're, we're done with the start, let's get rid of the start cart. Ground bar off. Copy. Okay, and it should disappear here shortly. Ground power is now off. And I'm going to go ahead and close the canopy so we can reduce the noise a little bit. I'm also going to raise my seat up a little bit because I can't really see over the the nose very well in the pattern so okay now I'm going to go ahead and turn the oxygen on I'm going to turn on the uh, the uh, autopilot to standby with the stab aug on I'm going to turn the radar to standby to hold the dish steady as we taxi around and we're going to go ahead and uh, lower the flaps to take off about half or half and let's see, we'll come up here, we'll turn this on to standby because we, uh, we're going to be moving, we'll keep it standby. Now, all the engine instruments or all the armament switches should be off. Now, the default location of the nose tail switch is in tail, so I'm going to go ahead and put it in off since we're not going to use it. And I want to turn on the uh, radar altimeter. Now, there's no off flag here, unfortunately, so the only way you can tell that it's on is the button is in. So that should be on now. Now, and we also want to set the trim here. We'll go ahead and set the trim so that both needles are pointing towards the nose, which equates to about 8 degrees nose up for the elevator. Um, still waiting on that uh, five minutes, and we're good there. And I think we've got the 90 seconds for the attack end, so I'm going to go to TR here. I'm also going to go to, uh, we'll go to button 5, which is ground uh, on the uh, radio. Okay, I think that is, uh, that's it. We don't have to wait in the chocks for this to warm up, so we can taxi. But while we're doing that, I'm going to talk about the other issue that we have, which is the angle attack gauge here. Let's see uh, if I can get down there a little bit more. Okay, there we go. Okay, uh, the angle attack gauge is incorrect, as uh, it, it's just built wrong, and there's no easy way to fix this. Um, but... Uh, the at optimum, um, by design, the angle attack needle should be at 3 o'clock, pointing directly at 3 o'clock, which, point, which points directly at, uh, I wonder why that killed. I still have my, uh, okay, well. Okay, it's, it points directly at the uh, VSI, and the VSI points directly back at it. So there's a nice straight line here at um, optimum angle of attack 
at um, 600 feet in the pattern, so when we're straight and level. And uh, unfortunately, angle attack, uh, optimum angle attack is not 16 units, which is what this little gizmo is telling us. Now, look, this is the max range indicator. This is the max endurance. This is the optimum indicator. And this little triangle, which is kind of hard to see, but that's the maximum stall of 27 units. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, and so um, 17 and a half units uh, on this gauge is right about here. If you look at 0, 5, 10, 15, 20, so 17 and a half is right about there. There's a little dot there, you can see it, but that's, that's where 17 and a half units is. Now, the programmers knew that it should be 17 and a half, and so at optimum angle attack, i.e. when the uh, donut is the only thing showing in the indexer, um, it, the needle points at 17 and a half units, which is up here. And it should be pointing at the optimum uh, index, which is this little gizmo here, and it should be at 3 o'clock. So the index is correct, but the whole dial is rotated a, a degree and a half counterclockwise, and in order to fix it, it would have to be pretty much redone, I think. So I don't know when that's going to happen. I did put a uh, right up into the into the bugs. Uh, I did the same thing for the uh, EGT indicator. So we'll see if that uh, eventually gets fixed. Uh, I think these guys are pretty true to their uh, true to the airplane. So I think those are the kind of things they they want to fix since they're they they are important to a Navy airplane. Okay, in any case, notice that the field elevation, uh, 2982, is at 400 feet. So we should be at 1,000 feet in the pattern for the FCLP pattern, which is what I'm going to demo. Um, uh, the FCLP is the field carrier landing practice pattern, which is very similar to the pattern at the boat, and it's used to train people to land aboard the boat or to get currency or recurrency for folks uh, who are going back to the boat after some other s assignment somewhere else. Okay, so uh, without any further ado, we're going to go ahead and taxi to the runway here. Okay, folks, here we are at the uh, hold short to uh, runway 31 at Laue. And we're getting ready to enter the FCLP pattern. I'm going to fly two circuits. Um, and... The first one is going to be in manual, and the second one will be a uh, one with APC or auto throttle engaged. I'm going to go ahead and put it in standby to warm it up. And eventually we should get an APC notice here telling us that um, the APC is powered up but not engaged. Okay, and we also want to do the takeoff checklist here. So we'll take a look at the trim. And that is uh, looking good. It's both pointing towards the nose, which is uh, ideal. Eight degrees nose up. Harness, we'll go ahead and lock that. Um, the canopy is locked, which is forward and closed. And let's see, the uh, flaps are set at half, which is good. Uh, speed brakes are closed, lights out. And the armament switches are all off, including the tail switch. Okay, there's two other items that I would like to in, add to this takeoff uh, um, checklist here. I don't doubt that this is what's in the airplane, but uh, obviously you want to make sure your pins are pulled. Um, and a lot of times those are pulled in the uh, in the little hangarette there with the crew chief watching and will hold both pins, pin from the lower handle and for the uh, face curtain handle up there. So there's two pins. For the seat in each in each cockpit, that uh, if there's a if it's a two seater and obviously in this airplane there's only one seat, but uh, you stow the pin somewhere either in your pocket or there's usually a bin back here somewhere that uh, they we can stuff the pins. And then the other thing is the arming the spoilers. So I'm going to go ahead and arm the spoilers here, and we get a light telling us that the spoilers are up, and we'll just take a quick peek, and the spoilers are up. Okay, and uh, uh, and we don't necessarily need them for takeoff, but we do need them if we happen to abort, so we arm them. 
Now, obviously, below 70%, the spoilers are up. Above 70%, the spoilers are down. So as we take off with the power at full, the spoilers will be flush with the, uh, the wing and won't be affecting airflow at all. Um, if we uh, abort and pull the power back to idle, the spoilers will pop up and do two things for us. Uh, it removes lifts, which puts, puts more weight on the landing gear, which um, improves the efficiency of the brakes. They are less likely to skid. And uh, then it also, by removing that same lift in a heavy crosswind or any kind of a crosswind, there's less likely to be a spill on the airplane. Uh, obviously, there's no nose gear steering. You, don't want, you wouldn't want to turn that on. But if you're trying to brake, um, then... Uh, uh, and if for some reason there's a, um, a, a an issue that causes you to go towards, like, say, a blown tire, going towards one side of the uh, runway or another, it's nice to have all the lift off the wings uh, so that it won't complicate the issue. This just spoils all the lift. Okay, that's the reason why we arm the spoilers for um, field, and, uh, field takeoffs and field landings. Uh, we pretty much leave them off. Sometimes uh, I think I've seen them wired off at the boat. Okay, uh, let's see. Okay, now we can see that that's completed, so we can go to land since we're about ready to take off. So it passed the test there. We got 121. Can't see that, but it says 121 there, and it's plus or minus, I think, 0.2 degrees on the drift. Okay, and we got the TRNG. We're on button five. That's the other thing. Now, <clears throat> typically when we do field carrier landing practice, we're either doing it with other members of our squadron and we're getting recurrent uh, periodically by our LSO. Say we, get, we left cruise uh, over a year ago and we're now getting ready to go on cruise again. So we're going to work our way through a bunch of FCLP periods just to give everybody some, uh, some practice uh, um, carrier approaches before we go out to the boat. Uh, in the training sense, uh, you would be with your class, which is five or six other pilots going through the same class at the same time, <clears throat> and we would all jump into the pattern, and, and the LSO would grade us as we came around, just like he does at the boat. So it's a very similar pattern, 600 feet AGL, which is 1,000 feet uh, here at the field MSL. Um, and we'll, we can match that with the radar altimeter just to verify that. But, uh, so essentially, uh, the, uh, the LSO owns the pattern for the, for the, uh, uh, period of the FCLP, which lasts maybe 45 minutes to an hour or so. <clears throat> and, uh, he will communicate via radio with the tower and he'll take control of the, uh, airfield. And then he will clear us all onto the runway, either one at a time or according to some pre-brief that we all went to uh, an, an hour or so earlier. <clears throat> so in this case, since it's just me, I'm just going to go out on the runway here and get in position. Uh, there's the APC that's all warmed up. Now it's just telling us that the APC is on, but it's not engaged. And I am going to turn off the gun sight because I don't like that interfering with uh, what I see out the front. You can see the carrier box there, and the Fresno lens, and the LSOs, and we're about ready to go here. So I'm just going to come to a stop here with my nose gear, hopefully pointing down the runway. And I'm also going to turn on my uh, the uh, control indicator so you can see what I'm doing with my controls around the pattern. <clears throat> just as a reminder, the first one is going to be uh, flying manually without APC, trying to maintain optimum around the pattern and on the ball. And I probably should say something about this uh, Fresno lens. Um, I don't know what the glide slope actually is. Uh, I, I I don't know that it's three degrees. I sense that it's a little steeper than normal, but it's, I think, uh, useful enough that uh, I think you'll see what I'm trying to do here um, uh, as we fly the pattern. Now, I'm going to also show you something here, which is my um, uh, throttle adjustment. So let's just go to axis assign. And this is my throttle here. We'll go take a look at that. And I have it. Now, I have a wind wing throttle that has an afterburner range. 
that I didn't want to use while I'm in an A4 since it has no uh, afterburner. And so I, I uh, made this slider and I got a user curve and I've got this set up so that uh, I think I'm going to change it a little bit. I'm going to bring this down a little bit. So like this. And I'm going to leave that like that. So well, maybe I'm going to increase this a little bit. Okay, um, trying to simulate as best as I can what I have now. Taking a look at this, I guess I can actually do this a little bit more. Yeah. Okay, now the red dot is where my where my wing wing throttle is. The black dot is where the engine in the simulator is. So it's it's at a higher RPM than uh, my stick is. And this is the, uh, right now I'm sitting at the afterburner detent. Now if I go through the afterburner, it'll go all the way up. So this way I got full power on the engine in the airplane and I'm at the MRT or at the uh, uh, afterburner detent so that I don't have to use that in order to fly the ball, which unfortunately puts me at a position on the throttle that I'm not used to. So it takes a little bit of getting used to. And the throttle is very sensitive here. And so I have to make very, very small corrections. So that's the, that's the explanation. So you'll see how that works out. <clears throat> okay, you can see how things work. All right, let's just get ready to go. Okay, I think I'm going to go up to 80%, and you can see both lights are out. If I come back, the lights are on. I go to 80%, and the lights are out. So I'm going to release the brakes and go to MRT, which is the throttle de the uh, afterburner detent. And I got full power in the airplane. Now I'm light loaded, so this is going to jump right off. And I'm going to pull the power back right away because I'm only going to 600 feet. And if you look at the fuel quantity gauge on the right side there, you can see that I'm at about 2,500 pounds. And that equates to a gross weight of about uh, 14,400 and something. So it's I'm below the, the max FCLP landing weight of 14,500 pounds. And that's important because you don't want to break the airplane. So I'm now going to slow down. Now, 121 on the airspeed is about what I'm looking for in order to be at optimum angle attack. Now, I don't want to descend. Let's go back up here. See, I just have to be real small on the throttle movements. See how I jump back up? I'm 150 knots. And I, well, it would help if I got the laps to full and the speed breaks out so I want to be in the proper configuration obviously okay now I want to try to adjust the throttle so that I can use the stick to maintain my AOA and my throttle to to control the VSI Yeah, see, it's it takes a while to spool up, and I'm making way too big of corrections. You can see that. Um, I think I need a little bit more RPM here, a little bit more trim rather. And I I, I want to climb. 
I want to climb here. So just th small throttle movements. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and start turning downwind. So you can see what I'm trying to do here. Catch it. I want to catch the uh, fall. I don't want to go back up again. So I'm trying to, I want to pull, God, come on, pull. See, unfortunately, in order to get it to switch, you almost have to, you have to go beyond it. So every correction is really three corrections, and they never stop. So it's one right after the other. So you make a correction, you make a second correction, and you make a third fine-tuning correction, and you, and you repeat. And that's what you're doing the whole time you're flying this. And you shouldn't stare at the uh, at those two gauges. You should be looking out the nose, and just kind of quickly blinking down there to uh, see what the what your performance is. But you want to get used to the attitude that gives you um, straight and level. And using the indexer gives you straight and level and optimum angle attack. And we're looking for about 135 ultimately on down one once we have reached the uh, um, distance, proper distance of beam of about 1.2 miles on average. <clears throat> okay, I'm making really small corrections, trying to make really small corrections, and have patience. Probably the hardest thing is having patience. And you have to anticipate. Okay, and I want to come a little left. I think I've got the right distance now. So I'm just going to come back a little left here. Ah, man. I'm overpowered here. Yeah, I came too far, so 135 is what I'm looking for. Okay. Slowly coming back. Slowly coming back. Slowly coming back. Okay, I'm coming up on the uh, uh, beam position here. Okay, and that's the Frenchies and the barn. Frenchies has the windmill here on the near side. Okay, and I don't want to start down yet. There's the beam, so I'm going to start my turn. And now I want to have a slow descent. Oops, I'm overpowered again. And I want to get down to about 500 feet by the 90. Okay, I've got too much rate of descent here. Uh, and I'm making too big of corrections. Uh, I'm getting too low here. Yeah. Small corrections, small corrections. Keep the turn coming. I'm going to be a little low as I enter the groove here, I think. So now I want to try to maintain that attitude. And we should be able to see the ball on the mirror. I want to... Okay, I'm fast. Got to work it off. There we go. Don't want to go slow here. I don't want to go fast again. Just maintain it. Oh. 
get back to optimum. There it is. I'm going to go right through it to slow. Get right for lineup. Okay, not too bad, but you can see that it's not easy. It's just continual um, uh, changes all the way along. Okay, put the speed brake in as you climb out, and then put it back out as you uh, get up to altitude again. And now I want to slow back down to 121 or so. And this time we're going to do APC. Auto throttle. Get back. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and turn on the APC. And I'm going to start flying the uh, uh, out, control the altitude and VSI with the nose. And then hopefully APC will maintain AOA. So <clears throat> I'm pretty much looking out the front with peeking only at the uh, VSI occasionally. And what you'll notice here probably fairly quickly is that there's a tendency for the APC to keep the airplane on the slow side of things. Okay, I'm going to start turning downwind now. Maintain that nose attitude with peeking at the VSI. Just peeking at the VSI, trying to maintain 600 feet. It's just everything is real sensitive. And I'm looking for uh, 135 degrees once I've got the proper distance of beam, which is uh, looks like I'm going to be pretty close to that. Okay, and I'll just roll out here. Kind of right along the, these uh, power lines. Okay, about 1.2 nautical miles of beam. Looking for Frenchies in the barn, which is uh, a ways yet. And just fine-tuning the uh, VSI needle. Now, if if the AOA, AOA gauge was correct, those two needles would be uh, pointing right at, right at each other. Right now, to me, it looks like we're slow and we're actually on speed. And that's just that's uh, not the way it should be. They should be both pointing right at each other. Makes it makes it nice, easy. It's a subtle difference, but it it's one that uh, pilots will write up if it's not there. Okay, coming up on uh, Frenchies. I'm a little high here. I got to work my way down a little bit. Coming up on Frenchies in the barn. Okay, there's my beam position. I'm going to start my turn. And I'm just a little bit of a descent to get to uh, holding that attitude. Holding that attitude. to get to 450 to 500 feet at the 90. And we're uh, got a ways to go yet here. Don't go down too fast. OK, 
Okay, we're about the 90. Let's keep the turn coming. I don't want to overshoot this. Slow the rate of descent a little bit. I'm going to be a little bit low. Should be rolling out just about right. Maybe a minor overshoot. And we'll see if we can see the, uh, the ball is just on the bottom of the mirror now. Just want to kind of work my way up. Raise that ball a little bit. Just keep it coming. Inch it up. Don't go too fast. That's it. That's it. Small corrections. Small corrections. Keep that ball up there. Alright. Alright there. Right about there. Alright. Okay. You can see that neither one is tremendously easy they're both uh, they both have their pluses and minuses it's maybe a little easier using APC but remember that uh, if you don't have EPC that means you're gonna have to fly manual and on a dark night you don't want to be uh, relearning manual ball flying so you really want to be good at manual ball flying before you ever go to uh, getting uh, using APC on any kind of a routine basis. Uh, that's what I would tell a, a, a real Navy pilot. Now here and obviously DCS you can do whatever you want but uh, that's what we would be thinking there uh, if we were in the fleet. Okay I'm just going to taxi back so uh, if yeah, that's really the meat of the, of the lecture but too. I'm going to um, uh, go through the okay. uh, shutdown process here. I'm going to go ahead and open this canopy. Now there's an artificiality here also in the sim where they they don't allow you to talk to uh, going to skid here. They don't want you to uh, they don't allow you to talk to the crew chief or the plane captain rather um, uh, while the canopy's closed. And that's kind of an artificiality that's uh, with no purpose because in in the real life I almost never talk to the uh, plane captain want him in the cockpit via voice unless he's climbed up on the canopy talking to me otherwise we use hand signals for the startup and the shutdown and all that stuff so I can obviously do that with the canopy uh, the canopy closed okay here comes the fuel truck so I'm gonna go ahead and make sure everything else is uh, turned off I think we have everything over here turned off and then I'm gonna go ahead and click the throttle off Place the wheel chocks. Copy. Wheel chocks <coughs> now in place. Okay, fuel truck will come in and uh, we'll get regassed. So I just want to make sure I got everything off here. I think I do. Okay, folks, <coughs> that's pretty much it.